These men are members of the KGB working in North America. This man is an illegal, a spy trained in Moscow and sent to the United States. This man is a defector from Cuban intelligence living in hiding under constant threat of death. This man ran operations against the West from Czechoslovakia. This man was trained by the most sinister department of the KGB and sent to North America. All of them received their orders from here. Number two, Dzerzhinsky Square in Moscow. This is the headquarters of the KGB. From here, the KGB continues to carry out the mandate given to the secret police by Lenin, who said it was to be the sword and shield of the revolution, the offense and defense of Soviet aims throughout the world. Lubyanka prison is the center of the vast KGB bureaucracy directly responsible to the Politburo for its operations against the West. Ever since Lenin took over the secret police of his defeated enemy, the Tsar, the Soviet espionage apparatus has mirrored the leadership under which it serves. Under Lenin, in the early days of revolutionary turmoil, it was known as the Cheka, and it imposed the Bolshevik rule upon the nation, setting up an international network of informers and tracking down and liquidating enemies of the new regime. Under Stalin, the name of the secret police was changed to GPU, and it became the most effective instrument of mass murder until the Second World War. Stalin used the GPU to eradicate millions of peasants in the Ukraine who protested the creation of collective farms from their lands. And during the mid-30s, Russia was wracked by what became known as the terror, the mass purges created by Stalin. Show trials became a function of the secret police activities and more than 75% of the Soviet general staff of the army and senior ministries were arrested by the GPU, tried and executed. In 1953, Stalin died. It was appropriate that the small band of survivors at the top of the communist hierarchy quickly arrested one of their own, Lavrenti Beria, the ambitious and coldly ruthless head of the secret police, which by then had become known as the NKVD. It was Beria who had presided over the purges ordered by Stalin. He himself was executed. In 1955, Nikita Khrushchev took full power. The secret police became known as the KGB. Under Khrushchev and his successors, the KGB looked increasingly outward to espionage and intelligence activities in the rest of the world. In the past decade, it has become a vanguard element of Soviet expansion and activities throughout the Third World, Western Europe, and North America. The KGB has become a massive bureaucracy reporting directly to the Politburo, the select body that runs the Soviet Union. Its functions are tied to the International Department, which runs and finances both communist and non-communist organizations in other countries, and to the Ministry of Defense, with whom it shares espionage activities in other nations. The KGB is organized into chief directorates. From a separate headquarters in Moscow, the first chief directorate controls foreign espionage activities. The second chief directorate is the largest and most important. With a network of informers, it is responsible for ensuring internal security. The current head of the KGB is Yuri Andropov, a key member of the Politburo, a close colleague of Leonid Brezhnev, and one of the most powerful men in Russia. As head of the KGB, Andropov controls the most influential and sinister bureau of the Soviet bureaucracy, whose main purpose is the total control of the Soviet people. For North America, the activities of the first chief directorate are divided into departments which carry out a wide range of activities from Soviet establishments located across the continent.
Since 1933, this building has served as a Soviet embassy in Washington. It is a major center of espionage activity in the United States. This is Alexander Kluyev, listed as an attaché at the embassy. He is a KGB officer. This is Boris Ivanov, a correspondent with the Soviet news service, TASS. He is also a KGB officer. During a recent hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the principal witness was Harold Brown, who at that time was Secretary of Defense. Subject, U.S. military posture and the defense budget for 1980. Present were Soviet TV reporter Yuri Soltan and his cameraman, Anatoly Ivanov, as well as Milos Stulva, a correspondent for Izvestia. Seen here is Dr. Mikhail Milstein, who is now with the Soviet Academy of Science, specializing in military affairs. Next to Milstein, Yuri Kapralov, first secretary of the Soviet embassy. Then there was a man who identified himself as Andrei Krutsky. The Soviet embassy lists him as an attaché, and this man, Viktor Tutin, official title, third secretary at the embassy. American intelligence sources identify both Krutsky and Tutin as being officers of the KGB. In North America, there are dozens of Soviet establishments. Everything from diplomatic missions to trade offices and businesses that sell tractors or operate merchant shipping. Since 1970, the number of Soviet officials in North America has increased dramatically. Until 1980, Richard Kinsey was deputy chief of the Soviet desk in the FBI. His duties were to closely monitor the activities of the Soviets in the U.S. The numbers have uh, doubled in the last 10 years, from 1970 to when I left in uh, early 1980. The Soviet presence had almost doubled. There was a time when I first was in, in the work where we could almost go one agent on one identified or suspected uh, Soviet intelligence officer. When I left, uh, quite the contrary was true, and we were vastly outnumbered where we, our agents were trying to cover three or four uh, known or suspected intelligence officers. One of the basic requirements for Soviet diplomats is to file travel plans whenever they travel in the U.S. or Canada. It is a restriction that in the Soviet Union is strictly applied to Western diplomats. But for the Soviets in North America, the theory and the practice seldom meet. We find through our coverage of them that they often deviate from those travel plans and uh, surprisingly enough will end up uh, traveling by the SAC base in Omaha, Nebraska when their travel plans call for them to go to Kansas or some other, some other route. And that's a violation of travel regulations. If we bring it to the attention of the State Department, then a strong note of protest is made to the Soviet ambassador. Is there anything ever done about these strong notes of protest? They're filed. The Soviet embassy in Washington is also distinctive for another type of spying operation. On the roof is a large antenna that appears harmless, but is used to electronically eavesdrop on telephone conversations in the Washington area. One third of all local calls and most long distance calls are transmitted by microwave, which can be plucked from the air by these Soviet antennae. Literally millions of calls are recorded and put through computers which are programmed to listen for certain key words or are activated by the phone numbers of people who are of interest to the Soviets. In 1972, while negotiating a purchase of surplus grain from the United States, the Soviet embassy used its telephone intercept capability to eavesdrop on conversations between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and grain dealers in the Midwest. Because the Soviets were able to acquire inside information about the U.S. bargaining position, they were able to outmaneuver the U.S. negotiators and sign a long-term contract for a record amount of grain at very low prices. Crop failures the next year in the U.S. drove consumer prices upwards, but the Soviets were able to continue buying grain at the low prices they had negotiated the previous year. In San Francisco, the Soviet consulate houses sophisticated electronic equipment and occupies a commanding position overlooking San Francisco Bay. Our investigations uh, determined that many of those antennae were in such a position that they had the capability 
of doing microwave intercepts in Silicon Valley. About an hour's drive south of San Francisco is the area that has come to be known as Silicon Valley. It is perhaps the most highly concentrated area of modern technology and research in the United States. Its products include microcomputers, silicon chips, and fiber optics, all vital component parts of military hardware. The San Francisco Consulate has also provided the Soviets with an easy access to U.S. military establishments on the West Coast. For example, by observing the Polaris submarines being refitted in clear view of a nearby seafood restaurant frequented by the Soviets, the numbers of American submarines then at sea can be determined. In the Canadian capital, the Soviet embassy is also equipped with antennae. However, the most visible microwave intercept equipment is not on the Soviet roof, but nearby on the roof of the Polish embassy. It is the Eastern Bloc nations, the Poles, the Czechs, and the East Germans that play an important part in the game of espionage. William Kelly is the former head of the RCMP Security Service. Intelligence services of bloc countries allegedly work independently of each other. But that isn't true. They work very closely with each other and under the dominance of the Russian KGB. There was a time uh, when the, uh, it was felt that the KGB were too well known around external affairs. And they didn't think that their, 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 the reception they'd receive would be the best. So uh, uh, they wanted to uh, naturally recruit or penetrate uh, and they decided that uh, the Hungarians could do the job uh, under the circumstances better than they could. Developing countries make... Uh, Ladislav Bittman was a deputy director of Czech intelligence at the time he fled to the West. Because there are many people who are afraid to get in touch, to be associated with a Soviet diplomat, for example, who uses, who is an intelligence officer and uses the diplomatic power in most cases. Uh, but they, they don't hesitate to develop a very friendly contact with a Czech diplomat or a Polish diplomat or an East German diplomat because they think what the representatives of these small countries can do. And they don't realize that they do basically the same job, uh, only under a different uh, color. But uh, uh, How closely allied were you with the Soviet intelligence, say? They know everything everything that the Czechoslovak or any other satellite service does. On the east coast of America, on Long Island, is another Soviet diplomatic residence. It is an estate near the town of Glen Cove, which serves as a weekend and summer retreat for Soviet officials of the nearby United Nations. Soviet citizen Arkady Shevchenko often stayed there while he was the Undersecretary General of the UN. And all the top floors of the building are full of the sophisticated equipment for the, uh, the uh, to, to intercept all the conversation, telephone conversation on anything which is going on around the area. At least 15 or 17 technicians who are working with, with, with there uh, to do all this job. The estate at Glen Cove and the electronic monitoring equipment jammed into it also represent an interesting geographic choice by the Soviets. I might point out that the estate, while it's located uh, somewhat north of the establishment, is very close to Grumman Aircraft Factory, which is one of the United States' main uh, builders of uh, sophisticated warplanes. And it's uh, sort of midway between the main plant and a testing facility that Grumman has further out on the island. And those antennae are pointed toward both facilities. The newest Soviet residence in New York is a building in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. They got permission to build on one of the highest sites in New York City. Situated at an elevation that permits interception of phone messages over the widest possible area. 
Yet back in Washington, the Soviets were not pleased with the location of their embassy. So they asked for and again were granted permission to build on another site at the corner of Belmont and Wisconsin Avenue. It is one of the highest locations in Washington. Because it's so high here, we'd like to get a good shot of Washington. Can we get in? It's forbidden. Uh, if you want to take it, you must go to our embassy and decide this method is our ship. In Washington, they, they, they will have everything. They can, I mean, listen to all the conversations which uh, are going on from White House to any, uh, the, 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 any departments uh, or, or Pentagon. You have a good view from here anyway. Yeah, I think so. Yes, on the roof. Yeah, I'll bet. Much of the construction on the Soviet embassy complex is already completed. The new residences have been built complete with antennae on the roof. In Moscow, the Americans had requested permission to build a new embassy to replace their old and overcrowded facilities there. In this instance, comparisons are useful. The United States was eventually offered and accepted a site on one of the lowest points of land in the city. And after years of bureaucratic wrangling, permission was only recently granted to begin construction. In the United States, there is one place that is more important for the KGB than even the embassy or its consulates. How important is the United Nations to the Soviets in terms of espionage? It's a nest of spies. The KGB operations in the UN are controlled by the first department of the first chief directorate of the KGB. This department directs all operations against the United States and Canada. The officers of the department operate from the embassies and consulates. Operations are also run from the UN itself, where over 500 Soviets work. The UN was formed to provide a forum for dialogue between the nations of the world. Each country sends its ambassadors and their staffs to the debates which occur in the General Assembly and Security Council. Awarded diplomatic status, their representatives live in the equivalent of embassies in New York City, and are expected to represent their country's interests. But in the Secretariat building are the international civil servants without diplomatic status. They are expected to be rigorously non-partisan in their administration of the UN's various departments and worldwide programs. In 1978, one of the most important Soviet defections to the West occurred. Arkady Shevchenko, who was the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, stunned his Soviet colleagues. As the highest ranking Soviet in the UN Secretariat, Shevchenko had knowledge of extensive Soviet espionage activities in the United States. So serious was the defection that two of the Soviet Union's highest ranking ambassadors, Dobrynin and Trianovsky, demanded a meeting with Shevchenko and his U.S. lawyer. This is the first broadcast of a tape recorded at that meeting. Ambassador Dobrynin reveals that Shevchenko was privy to Soviet state secrets, even though he was supposedly an impartial UN civil servant. That he read top secret documents in his mission. Up till the last day when he left, it showed that there was no surveillance. He gave me copies of this letter. He refers to the, what he read, a betrayal of the ideals of the October Revolution, which is taking place now in the USSR, the monstrous abuses carried on by the KGB compel me to take the decision to renounce my membership in the CPSU, etc. Well, that naturally leads one to think uh, that he's in a, some abnormal state because a normal person or a one acting at his uh, free will uh, cannot make these explanations. There was no need for him to stay in the foreign service for 30 years or 20 years and then fi finally find out that he disagrees with the fruits of the uh, October Revolution. The United Nations Secretariat give so, gives so many advantages for the KGB to penetrate actually almost all uh, aspects of the American life because they, unlike diplomats, 
go and travel across the country freely. They even should not, under no obligation to notify the State Department of American Mission about the, their travel trips or participation anywhere. Probably the most active intelligence gathering functions are carried out by Soviets assigned to the United Nations. I say that uh, for a number of reasons, primarily that UN employees also have total freedom of movement throughout the United States. It's a, uh, it's a golden mine uh, for the uh, Soviet Union. That it's so easy to have such a huge number of the people involved in the intelligence activity. My estimate would be that the people who are working for the Soviet in intelligence in general in New York, about 300 or 350 uh, persons in war engaged in all this activity. In theory, the employees are there to carry out the ideals and humanitarian causes of the United Nations and run the bureaucratic machinery. But Shevchenko quickly discovered that even though he was one of the United Nations' highest-ranking bureaucrats and the head of his department, the orders came from the KGB. I, I had in my department 13 Soviets, and uh, uh, the, at least seven of them were professional KGB officers because they didn't do anything. They didn't work in, in my department. They didn't receive orders from me as the head of the department. They received the orders from, from their bosses in the mission, from the KGB resident. This man was one of those Soviets working for Shevchenko. His name is Valdek Enger. He was placed in Shevchenko's department not by the normal UN hiring practices, but by the KGB resident or senior officer in New York City who requested Shevchenko's help in placing the spy in the United Nations. I agreed with that, but uh, I think it was a mistake because it was uh, very difficult to get rid uh, of him later uh, because uh, he, he transformed my office uh, into a kind of a center of gathering all, of all these KGB guys and the... Uh, collecting all these materials and all the things, and he didn't do anything at all. Whenever I asked him uh, to, to do something uh, uh, for, for, for the department or for the secretariat or to write something for me, he was always reluctant or, or absent or have this bunch of his KGB guys in my office. I was, I was absolutely, I was mad about this situation. Here, Enger is asking a U.S. naval commander to pass on secret documents. Yes, Jim. Oh, yes. Okay. Fine, thanks. Do you have this up? Yes, I do. You do. Okay, yes. Now, you know what? Uh, proceed now to the slum. And just after the Essex Stall Plaza. Yeah? You'll see the phone booth. Public phone booth. Uh-huh. Now, the second phone booth from the right, if you look at the, in front of you, you know, uh, after the booth. Just under the shelf, you'll see the small box, okay? Okay. And uh, follow the instructions completely, and you'll find everything there, all right? Okay. Okay. Right, I'll talk to you later. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. The head of the KGB operating out of the Soviet mission to the United Nations has been identified by Shevchenko as V. Kazakov. Within the UN, the Soviets are also able to exert influence. Viktor Lesyovsky is a KGB officer who occupies the post of special assistant to the Secretary General in the United Nations. He chooses the speakers for the debates in the General Assembly. Vasily Solodonikov is another KGB officer who served as a senior secretariat official. A man who served with Solodonikov at the International Relations Institute in Moscow was Igor Glagolev, who was an advisor to the Politburo before he defected to the West. Yes, there were high-ranking uh, members of the KGB. They were not, uh, you know, people who were used by the KGB because KGB can use, you know, many people without their knowledge. But they were just uh, regular agents of the KGB. And uh, the trouble is that they control the staff of the United Nations. Permanently. Always. Solodonikov was an advisor to Joshua Nkomo and other rebel leaders during the war in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. 
is now a key formulator of Soviet policy in Africa and is their ambassador to Zambia. Later on, he was assistant uh, to the Secretary General, and later on, he was um, director of the Institute of Africa. And now he's uh, amb- the, Soviet, the Soviet ambassador in Zambia, where he masterminded the takeover of Zimbabwe, and now he's organizing the takeover of South Africa. Noel Field joined the State Department as a Foreign Service officer in 1926. During the 1930s, he became a Soviet agent. Lawrence Duggan was head of the Latin American desk of the State Department and was a political advisor to the Secretary of State. He, too, was a Soviet agent. Both Duggan and Field were brought into a Soviet espionage ring by the same recruiter, a woman of amazing persuasiveness. I got the Noel Field. And I got them Larry Duggan. And I got them all, you know, sort of uh, small fry, like Ryan and, you know, technical personnel, several women that were male drops and so on and so forth. And it was always done, for example, with women, it was mostly done with sex. I would always send somebody who was handsome and, and uh, they generally went to bed with, whatever it was, and, uh, and it worked. During the 1930s, Hayda Massing was Soviet espionage's most effective recruiting agent in America. This is her only television interview, filmed shortly before her death in 1981. During the 1920s, she married into the Communist Party in Europe, falling in love with its intrigue and fellowship. Her first husband was Gerhard Eisler, a top official of the Communist international espionage arm, the Comintern. When you were 17 and you joined the Communist Party or became a member of that yes. circle, was it an emotional rather than a political conversion? Only emotional, not political at all. Didn't understand a thing about politics. As I said, I would have understood this one sentence. It is a theory, an ideology, which has as its aim, a better life for all. Well, that was good enough for me, better life for all. I'm amongst all. But that was as as political as as it was. Otherwise, it was emotional. I married into the party. But for somebody who didn't understand it, you became one of their most effective operators. Later. Much, much, much later. Much later when I understood much more, and when I, uh, when, uh, really, my effectiveness is so closely married, connected to fascism. I was effective because there was fascism, and fascism had to be fought. It took me a long time, and I didn't want to realize it, that actually I was not fighting fascism. It was all baloney. The Russians used me. But to admit that to yourself is, of course, very degrading, self-degrading. You hesitate very much to do that. So for a long time, I pretended that I believe that this is the way to fight fascism, and I acted it out. Okay, well, let's go into some of the areas where you were very successful. You came over to America in the early 1930s. What did you do, and how did you get into that circle where you could operate effectively? Well, first of all, when I came, I knew people. You see, I knew people. I'd met people in Moscow. I'd met many Americans in Moscow. I was a functionary. For example, I was called on by the Comintern to entertain important Americans when they came to Moscow. So I had had connections, personal connections. The connections were with those in the American government. So Heda Massing, closely controlled by the Russians, working in New York City and armed with a sharp wit and a fierce determination, went on to recruit Lawrence Duggan, one of the senior members of the U.S. State Department. You know, the thing that is so interesting is it wasn't difficult. I called him 
uh, because I understand, uh, you know, he was a friend of Noel Field um, and said that I wanted to see him. And I went into the State Department, into his room, and we made an appointment. And I uh, approached him directly, hard. Larry, I said, you know, I needn't tell you about fascism. You know it all. You know it better than I because you see all the material I don't see. We want your help. Will you help us? And he said, yes. I have certain conditions. But yes, I will help you. Now, I will give you all the material that I think might be of interest to you and the Russians. He knew immediately who I was. He was nobody's fool. And uh, only I will not give you the material per se. I will dictate it to somebody, and the somebody has to be English-speaking and uh, a very good shorthand. There it was. I couldn't believe it. While recruiting Noel Field, Hayda Messing uncovered another Soviet spy ring in Washington, of which she had been unaware. I had worked on Noel Field for a long time. I had listened to Wagner, which I hate. I had read Freud, which I dislike, and discussed fine points of Freud with him, you know, really lying in my teeth. And um, because I wanted, I wanted him. I wanted to good, wanted to do a good job. And I had, I also liked the family. I liked her better than him. He was a little bit, although he was rather good looking, you know, very tall and very sort of gentlemanlike. To me, he was a little bit unappetizing. I really, could, it must have been a body smell. Uh, I don't know what it was, but anyhow, I liked her better. She was also more honest. She was, she was a little dumb. And one day, uh, <clears throat> I said, you know, Noel, it's about time that you, you have more or less agreed that you will uh, work with me. Now, I think we uh, ought to start. And he said, you know, Heda, I wanted to tell you this. Uh, and I hesitated because I know it will upset you. But I have decided that I will not work with you. But I would rather work with somebody who does exactly the same thing you do, who is, however, with me in the same department. And it would be so much easier, technically, to convey whatever I have to give to this person. And I said, who is this person? Of course, terrified. Here was my investment of a one year studying Wagner and Freud for that what you uh, anyhow, I said, um, who is this man? And he said, I don't think you know him. His name is Al Jahiz. He was an advisor to President Roosevelt at the crucial Yalta conference and was the man who flew to Washington with the historic charter documents of the United Nations Organizing Conference in San Francisco, where he had served as temporary secretary general. Alger Hiss was a rising star in the State Department and director of the Office of Special Political Affairs. He was never far from center stage. After allegations were made of his communist activities, he appeared before the House Un-American Activities Committee. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. Throughout two famous trials and a conviction for perjury, he has steadfastly proclaimed his innocence. And today, there is a strong lobby in the United States to overturn his convictions. Things Mr. Chambers charged, except that I knew him briefly. Were you ever a communist? No. This man's memory is rather different. Nathaniel Weil was a member of the same Communist Party cell as Alger Hiss. I want to ask you if you ever met Alger Hiss. Oh, yes, about 30 times or so, 30 or 40. Under what circumstances? Well, I'm speaking about, uh, you see, the cell met every week and uh, attendance was a uh, very a duty to be taken very seriously you had to have an extremely good excuse for not being there so that if uh, one assumes that um, that I was in this unit for nine months 
uh, and that there was a meeting every week that works out to about 30 or 40 times. But Hader Massing, trying to recruit Noel Field, had no idea that Alger Hiss was also working for the Soviets. Each of the communist cells were small and carefully separated. In this case, both Alger Hiss and Hader Massing were trying to recruit the same man. I met Alger Hiss because Noel called me a week after I'd been there in New York and said, can you come to Washington? I have dinner, a dinner date for you and Alger Hiss at my house. And I said, of course I'll come. And I came. And I met him. And the beginning was that he said, so you are the girl that is uh, trying to take Noel away from me. And I said, uh, uh, well, you are the man who is trying to take Noel away from me. And uh, uh, then I said, I suppose, I don't know the exact words, uh, uh, don't forget, after all, I'm female and I'm a fighter, and I won't let that happen so easily. Uh, and uh, he grinned, and uh, then we had all sorts of conversations. We stood alone, he and I, at the window and spoke, and uh, the farewell was that I said, or he said, and I don't remember who said what, but he, I think he said, whoever gets Noel, after all, we are working for the same boss. More than 90% communist agents are blackmailed. These people are not ideological supporters but they are brutally blackmailed. Was this what you looked for when you were in the Czech intelligence? Yeah, the, the that's ability right. to blackmail people? That's right, that's right, yeah. Like that you were forcibly trapped. And we know the way that you were trapped, it was a homosexual entrapment, that you were entrapped in which the Czechs got you. This is correct, right? This man was blackmailed while on embassy duty in Prague, Czechoslovakia. As an Air Force cipher clerk, he was in a position to seriously compromise NATO readiness secrets. It was a stupid thing to do, and I did it. I got caught doing it by somebody that shouldn't have, or well, shouldn't have. I've gone through this rigmarole for over a year after we left Prague. I haven't heard from anybody since that mm -hmm. time. Most Americans are very naive, politically very naive. And so I think it's, in many cases, it's very easy for, for communist intelligence officers to get in touch with important Americans to seduce them in one way or another and later to blackmail them. I was not contacted in Czechoslovakia until about a month or two before I ever left the country. When you say contacted, you're contacted? By the Czech. By the Czech intelligence service. Well, I don't know who they were. I just saying I was contacted. Yeah. You know, I assumed that they had to be there. What do you mean when you say contacted? How, what form did that contact take? Well, it was just a meeting on the street. Of a man just walked up to yeah. you? And what did this man say? Well, he indicated that they had had photographs of me and, yeah. uh, you know, that he would contact me at, at some future date. Well, can you tell me, what did the Czech <coughs> intelligence service ask you for or want you to do? There was no discussion at all. It was just the fact they confronted me with the fact that they had pictures and photographs of me doing this homosexual act with the other individuals in Boston. That was the whole extent of it. There was nothing asked for or given. When you say the fellow that was involved in the situation? Well, in the, in the, in the, the photographs? Yeah. yeah. He, he, was, he, he was the other man with whom you were having this affair with. Right. And he defected, and as a result, that was how they found out That's about right. you. Right. And you were never asked for secret documents there was just a man that came up to you in the street in Prague and said that we have photographs of you and we're going to ask you for something at a later date at a later date and it was never indicated what they wanted or how often or how soon or whatever what kind of information could you have theoretically given them God knows God knows
In Moscow, the KGB targets not only low-ranking officials. Sometimes their blackmail extends right to the top. John Watkins was the Canadian ambassador to the Soviet Union in the late 50s when he was targeted for recruitment. Two KGB defectors, Nosenko and Golitsyn, have revealed that Watkins was under KGB control, but the story has never before received official confirmation. William Kelly is the former head of the RCMP security service. They knew he was a homosexual. He knew that they knew he was a homosexual. Well, are you saying that he was being blackmailed by them? Uh, in, in a kind of a way, yes. Uh, that he knew that they could embarrass him if he didn't cooperate. While in the Soviet Union, Lester B. Pearson, later to become Canadian Prime Minister, and John Watkins met with Khrushchev at his Dacha on the Crimean Sea. The meetings were arranged by the Soviets to increase Watkins' prestige in Pearson's eyes and to speed his promotion to positions with access to sensitive information. When you find that a man uh, like Watkins, uh, uh, an ambassador, was a homosexual, and you knew the pressure that was being placed on homosexuals in uh, Russia at that time, uh, he was an obvious target for, uh, for KGB, and he was surrounded by the KGB. Watkins' handler was Anatoly Gorsky, alias Professor Nikitin, who had controlled the Soviet agents Philby, McLean, Burgess, and Blunt in Britain. Soon after Pearson's visit, Watkins was transferred back to Ottawa as Assistant Undersecretary of External Affairs. External Affairs chairs the committee that controls all of Canadian intelligence matters. He died of a heart attack on October 10, 1964, in Montreal, after being interrogated by the RCMP. For over ten years, Tom Fox was head of U.S. military counterintelligence in charge of breaking major Soviet operations in America and Europe. Well, the Soviets are like uh, any good headhunting business organization that's looking for good talent. The Soviets will establish a relationship with the individual, determine the, the individual's needs, desires, strengths, and weaknesses, and try to exploit that. David Barnett was a former employee with the CIA whose business was facing bankruptcy. His solution was to approach the KGB. In exchange for money, he compromised several CIA operations and the lives of the agents involved. He was instructed by the Soviets to obtain positions with several congressional intelligence committees in order to pass on inside information. For his services, he received $92,000. But the Soviets used subtler methods for recruiting. At the time when he was a congressional assistant with access to U.S. naval readiness secrets, Jim Kappas was approached by a Soviet official offering him the opportunity to write articles for a leading Soviet press agency. And I, as a staff member, had access to most of the classified materials that might have been presented to the committee from time to time. How were the approaches first made? Uh, initially, it was strictly social. Uh, later, of course, the meetings were arranged. They were arranged for just the two of us. They were arranged at, uh, primarily at bars. What exactly did he suggest you should do in the beginning? He suggested that I write articles for him, uh, theoretically, to be translated and published in the Novosti Press, which is a Soviet uh, press service. Uh, of course, later it became more obvious that the type of stories that he was seeking were those that were uh, based on classified information or information that was not generally known to the public. In attempting to recruit agents, the KGB also uses the services of the International Information Department, which controls TASS, Pravda, Izvestia, and the Novosti Press Agency. A man who is familiar with the procedures of recruitment is Yuri Bezminov, who served with Novosti in India before defecting to the West. Because during my... 12 years with Novosti, I, 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 it was quite clear to me that about 70 to 80, it's hard to, to count, percent of the Novosti employees are at the same time either full-time officers of the KGB or part-time co-opted agents like myself when I was working for the Novosti. For Soviets and, like Yuri Bezminov or Carlo Tuomi, an illegal sent to America to recruit agents, 
the methods of recruitment are deceptively easy. How do you recruit somebody? What do you do? You recruit them by establishing a friendship, but you don't you don't recruit them as a as a Soviet spy. You're supposedly working for some corporation which is interested in the trade secrets of a competing corporation. Or maybe you're asking information on behalf of a friend who's writing a technical book. Uh, so Is this what you were told in Moscow, that you should not say that you're working for the Soviets, that you should work for a company or... Right, right. You come out, you come out as a Soviet intelligence agent only when you recruit the person on ideological basis. In the 1930s, no one was more successful in recruiting young Americans than Ada Massing. She recruited at the highest levels of government and discovered that the ideological approach worked best with the privileged in America. It would be almost impossible to recruit the working class. Almost impossible. Of America? Yeah. But it would be easy to recruit the intellectual and middle class. But what does the Communist Party have to offer the elite? Great ideas. The freedom of all time. Marxism. A different economical system. Thoughts. New medical experiments. New, the world, the world. You see, the Soviet Union has never changed its goal. Never. You know, it, it's, its goal as a phrase. It still wants to dominate the world. You know that. It has never changed that. In the late 1950s, when Fidel Castro was taking his revolution out of the mountains toward the ultimate victory of Havana, the world watched what was believed to be a popular uprising of the people. Yeah, not communism or Marxism in our ideas. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. But the revolution provided a new base for the KGB and the communist intelligence networks. Ladislav Bittman was a deputy director with so Czech intelligence. Years after the revolution, the Czechs helped to build up the, the Cuban intelligence service. And then, I think in the early 1960s, the Soviets took over completely when Cuba was uh, really in, in the hands of the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union. Here at the Cuban mission to the United Nations in New York City, where 98 Cuban nationals work, at least half are members of the DGI the Cuban intelligence service. This man is Nestor Garcia. Until the summer of 1980, he was officially listed as the first secretary to the Cuban mission. But in reality, he was chief of station for Cuban intelligence in New York City. In Moscow, the direct responsibility for running Cuban intelligence is assigned to Department 11 of the KGB, the same department that controls the Czechs, Poles, and other European communist intelligence agencies. Since the late 1960s, Soviet KGB officers living in Havana have directly run the operation of Cuban intelligence. As a result of two years' research, the Connections team has been able to ascertain these startling facts. Cuban intelligence was taken over by the Soviets in 1969. At that time, it became, and has remained, totally financed and controlled by the KGB. Now living in hiding, this man is the highest-ranking Cuban officer to defect to the United States. This is the first known television interview that a DGI officer has given. In uh, Moscow, I was trained in uh, recruiting of agents, in infiltrating uh, the CIA, in counterintelligence. Was all your training 
directed at the United States, all your training in Moscow directed at the United States? Even if the work dealt with uh, operations in Italy, France, England, Canada, it was ultimately directed against the United States. In the case of a uh, plan of sabotage against an American embassy, the physical layout of the plant had to be known. Was there any other installations and embassies that were looked at for sabotage? All the uh, big uh, American companies. Since the late 1960s, General Semenov of the KGB has controlled the DGI from Havana for the Soviets. General Semenov, the Soviet chief, would be the one who would give the order. So the Russians controlled Cuban intelligence, actually controlled? Totally and absolutely. The second most important base of Cuban intelligence in North America is the Cuban consulate in Montreal. From here and other Cuban diplomatic missions, the DGI conducts intelligence and espionage operations through a spy network designed to increase the KGB's penetration of North American life. You saw the files of these people in Havana, correct? Yo conozco muchos. Yes, I know many. Were they working, for instance, trying to get defense secrets from America? Definitivamente. Yes, definitely so. What else? ¿Qué otra cosa? Eh, información política. Political information. Econ economic information. Leftist movements in the United States on the blacks. Información sobre las plantas de... Industrial plants of the United States, like uh, power plants and so on and so forth. Why would they be interested in power plants? This information is necessary to the Soviets. This former DGI officer was shown the official list of the 12 Cubans stationed in Washington at the Cuban interest section. How many on that list do you know as being in intelligence? Four. four. There are four on that list. Yes. Certainly. Certainly. Have you ever heard of a Mr. Ricardo Escartan? He's an intelligence officer. How about Mr. Juan Carbonell? Juan Carbonell is another officer of intelligence. Juan Carbonell is another intelligence officer who was in uh, Jamaica. Jesu Arbalea? También. Uh, also. Mr. Martinez? Sí, ese otro oficial de intelligence. Yes, this is another uh, officer of the uh, DGI. Six months after this interview, Ricardo Escartin was expelled from the U.S. for espionage activities. But the other DGI officers, Carbonell, Arbolea, and Martinez, are still operating in Washington. In the mid-1960s, the black ghettos of America erupted in flames and violence in an apparently spontaneous protest. The riots did not need instigation by outside elements, yet once the conditions were ripe, revolutionaries of the left moved in funded and supported by the Cuban DGI. One such revolutionary was Philip Luce. What was the nature of your meeting with Fidel Castro? Uh, our nature, first of all, was we met a number of times. But our first meeting dealt with uh, what the group would do in Cuba. Uh, secondly, was uh, what we could do in the United States once we returned. And third of all, uh, we received uh, uh, over $20,000 to bring back to the United States. Uh, the next year, we were engaged in uh, tremendous uh, uh, riots in New York City, uh, which then spread to uh, Cleveland, uh, to Los Angeles, to other areas. Agitation at that juncture was vital, uh, not only to our cause, but to the cause of Cubans. We trained people on the use of weapons, we also trained people on how to stand on top of their tenement buildings and throw down garbage cans filled with bricks. We also taught them how to make Molotov cocktails. As a matter of fact, the Cubans <clears throat> at that time said to us, your revolution is your own revolution. But while we were in Cuba, they gave us money to bring back to the United States to be utilized uh, in terrorist activities. 
They also invited us to the embassy, wherein they gave us money to send young Americans to Cuba who were later trained in terrorist activity. We went to the Cuban embassy uh, on a number of occasions uh, to get funding. In the 1960s, Bernadine Dorn was one of the leaders of the violent radical group known as the Weathermen. On December 3, 1980, in Chicago, Bernadine Dorn surrendered after 10 years in hiding. With her was another weatherman, Bill Ayers, with whom she had been living. They held a press conference and stated their continued commitment to radical change. Resistance by every means necessary is happening and will continue to happen within the United States as well as around the world. And I remain committed to the struggle ahead. The man with Bernadine Dorn, Bill Ayers, was one of the key members of the Weathermen during the 1960s. A man who knew Ayers well during those years was Larry Grathwall, a former member of the Weather Underground, which had developed close ties with the Cubans. Well... When, when the Cubans viewed the, the revolutionary struggle in the United States, they recognized the fact that the, that the left as it existed in 69 and 70 was not capable of, of overthrowing the government by itself. Consequently, they, they had hoped that the, that the group itself would be able to, to attack the system from within and provide assistance to the international movement, the international communist revolution. As a weatherman, if I became cut off from the main body of the, of the organization, the Weather Underground organization, I could make contact or reestablish contact by going to the Cuban embassy in Mexico or Canada and asking to, as an example, I want to get in touch with Bernadine Delgado. That was the code word, Delgado. And I would tell them that I'm Larry Delgado and I can be reached at such and such a phone number or at such and such an address. And the Cubans would make the connection and put me back in contact with the... How do you know this? I don't how do you know. This. How do you know this information? Oh, Bill Ayers gave me those instructions and in, it was either February or March of 1970 in Detroit. The Cuban DGI is organized into seven departments and subdivided into geographic sections, the largest one being the United States section. It controls North American operations, including the UN, diplomatic posts, and radical groups. During the 1970s, hundreds of young Americans circumvented U.S. travel regulations to go to Cuba to harvest sugarcane and experience the Cuban Revolution firsthand. As a cover for the recruitment of the weathermen, the DGI organized the Venceremos Brigades. The organizers, tour guides, and hosts were officers of the DGI who used the occasion to train young American radicals. Cuban intelligence was well prepared for the Venceremos brigades when they arrived. Every time that the Venceremos brigade contingent arrived in Cuba, all the uh, operational of the um, DGI had to drop what they were doing and go to work on the Venceremos brigade. We had to investigate, collect background to see who could be recruited what information could be obtained? Do you know of young Americans who were recruited in the brigade to work for the Cuban intelligence who came back to America and were secretly working for the Cubans? Yes, and they are still working. Still working for yeah. the Cubans in America? Yes, definitely. The brigade was established with the sole purpose of providing a cover for the weathermen to get their people to Cuba for training. And that that's why it existed. As a matter of fact, when our people came back off the first Venceramus Brigade, and, and I think it was February of 1970, the criticism that the uh, Cubans had made about the Venceramus Brigade indicated that the majority of people being sent there, 
they felt were useless. They really weren't helping them harvest sugarcane. But that it was justified in the sense that here was a means to train and politicize weathermen contacts and weathermen. Cuba somehow had the ability to uh, bring out young people at that time. Uh, the feeling of, of communism with a uh, mambo beat, or uh, somehow that uh, what was happening in Cuba was totally different than what was happening anyplace else in the world. This was the main reason of the interest showed by the Russians in trying to control the DGI, because the Cubans could work far more easily than the Soviets. Weren't the weather people aware that they were being used by the Soviets in some no. way? No, they, they view the Cubans as being the vanguard of the international communist revolution. Now, the vanguard essentially means that the Cubans are at the very tip of the spear. They're the leadership. Um, the Russians are being used by the Cubans. Now, this is the weatherman's rationalization of this, this interaction between the Soviets and the Cubans. The Cubans said, you've got to become active. You've got to start doing things. And planning a national action to protest the beginning of the Chicago 8 trial and to commemorate the, the, the riots during the, the Democratic National Convention of 68 uh, and to protest the war in Vietnam is not action. Action requires that you confront the system violently. So when the weathermen got back from Cuba, they changed the national action to the days of rage. The days of rage in October 1969 was an attack on the city of Chicago and its police department. For four days, anti-war protesters, urged on by agitators of the weathermen, rioted in the streets, engaging in violent confrontations and pitched battles with the police. Quebec during the 1960s was rocked by terrorist bombings and confrontations between the police and French-Canadian separatist demonstrators supporting the FLQ. DGI contacts within revolutionary organizations like the FLQ had built an international terrorist ring. It was late March or early April of 1970. I was in Buffalo, New York. Uh, the FOCO there consisted of uh, five people. Bill Ayers and Naomi Jaffe were two of those people. Uh, Bill and uh, Naomi left and went to Canada. Where at in Canada, I don't know to meet with members of the Quebec Liberation Front with the objective of establishing closer ties with them and, and cooperating in actions, if possible, uh, on both sides of the border. And they also received, it was either two or $3,000 from the Quebec Liberation Front that had been sent from Cuba for the weathermen. There was an attempt in 1965 by a group of blacks who had gone to Cuba under my auspices to blow up the Statue of Liberty. The Black Liberation Front, which had been formed in Cuba in 1964, was the prime mover behind this plot. The bombing was prevented, however, when the police recovered the explosives from their hiding place in the Bronx. Amongst those arrested was Michel Duclos, a member of the French-Canadian separatist organization which provided the explosives to the Cuban-trained extremists. She pleaded guilty to illegally transporting dynamite. We know that uh, uh, the Weatherman Underground Organization uh, went to Cuba and utilized the same kinds of techniques that we utilized. Uh, these people uh, did engage in, in, in direct bombing and killing uh, in the United States. So I fear it. And yet most of them haven't been heard from for a long, long time. That's right, but they're still out there. They're underground. And the question is, uh, over a long period of time, what does it take to activate them?
biggest Cuban intelligence efforts against the United States do not take place in North America. It is in the Caribbean and Central America where the Cuban DGI, backed by the Soviet KGB, are actively assisting revolutionary movements hostile to the United States. In 1978, the government of the Caribbean island of Grenada was replaced by a Marxist regime led by Morris Bishop. The government of the criminal dictator Eric M. Gary has been overthrown. All police stations are hereby ordered to put up a white flag as a symbol of surrender. One by one, the governments that have been called right-wing dictatorships are being attacked and replaced by left-wing dictatorships financed by the Cubans. Brother Morris Bishop, the long night of terror, the long night of repression and hardship has ended. In Grenada, one of the first acts of the new government was to bring in Cubans to build a new airport. The airport, like the island itself, has military importance to the Cubans and, ultimately, to the Soviets. Grenada's proximity to the Venezuelan and Middle Eastern oil tanker routes to the U.S. make it an important strategic location. And in Nicaragua, where the Sandinistas overthrew the regime of Anastasia Somoza, over 3,000 Cubans moved in immediately after the revolution. On the first anniversary of their takeover, a new government staged a celebration for visiting guests, like Fidel Castro, whose ambassadors to Nicaragua, Lopez Diaz, and to Grenada, Torres Rizzo, are top DGI officers. One of the speakers was Morris Bishop of Grenada. In 1981, we will be able to speak not just of revolutionary Cuba. Ya podamos hablar no solo de la Cuba revolucionaria. Not just of revolutionary Nicaragua. No solo de la Nicaragua revolucionaria. But also of revolutionary El Salvador. Sino también de un El Salvador revolucionario. And revolutionary Guatemala. Y de una and Guatemala y un Honduras revolucionario. El Salvador, Guatemala, Puerto Rico. One after the other, the revolutionary movements of the islands and the Central American nations are being assisted by the Cubans and behind them, the Soviets. Puerto Rico is an important area for Cuban activities. Electronically linked with Navy installations on the U.S. mainland, Puerto Rico is crucial as a submarine tracking base. Using top-secret undersea monitoring equipment, Americans are able to keep track of Soviet submarine actions on the entire Atlantic coastline. In April 1980, 10 FALN Puerto Rican revolutionaries were arrested outside Chicago, Illinois. With them was a van filled with explosives and arms. They were convicted on February 11, 1981 of seditious conspiracy for a wave of bomb blasts that have killed five people and wounded at least 100 others. Does Castro run the Puerto Rican movement in the United States? Sí, yes. Conozco de muchas operaciones. I know of many operations. Que se hicieron a través del centro de Nueva York. That uh, were done through the, uh, the center of New York. Que donde se les dio dinero, o se les ha dado dinero. Where they received money. Eh, explosivos, explosives, armas, uh, weapons, y reclutamiento que se han hecho para for them to work in the United States. Soviet naval activities in the Caribbean and the Atlantic are of increasing strategic significance, as is Havana's harbor to the Soviet fleet. In addition to surface ships, submarines are a vital part of a growing armada. For submarines are hard to detect as they lie off America's shores armed with nuclear missiles.
fishing ships are another part of the Soviet armada off the shores of North America. Often used for electronic intelligence gathering, the fishing ships also serve as shields protecting the submarines below from the radar and sonar of the anti-submarine forces of the Americans and Canadians. It was on one of these ships that Boris Stern served. The submarine kept contact with my ship. When we came near Newfoundland, the captain had a radiogram on the submarine location. My ship, the fishing ship, covered the submarine from the airplanes above. These ships have also been used to provide Irish terrorists with arms. My ship, this is a fishing My ship, this is a fishing ship and not a military ship. At two o'clock at night, as my ship came near Ireland, two boats with Irish people came to the ship, and the KGB officer on our boat, Misha Boulanger, gave them a very big box, we think, of arms. Soviet espionage efforts in North America are designed to assist the capabilities of their submarines in the Atlantic and Caribbean. Some of these efforts have seemed trivial, yet the results are still affecting Canadian and American security. This Canadian civil servant was targeted by the KGB. He was at first offered small payments for unclassified information, but the promise of larger sums soon led to his acquiring more sensitive strategic documents such as classified naval maps of old wrecks that lay on the bottom of the Atlantic along the Canadian coastline. William Kelly was head of the security service of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police at the time. Well, now, these maps were of extreme importance to the Russians, and particularly for their submarine commanders, because when there was the patrol boats of the Canadian Navy on the surface, the submarine would know it, and to avoid detection, that's all the submarine had to do was settle down alongside of a wreck, so that when the patrol boat above would make contact with some sounding device with the bottom of the ocean with some metal down there, he'd look on a map and he'd say, oh yes, this is just a wreck, and he'd move on, leaving the submarine to continue its patrol safely. In the 1950s, an obscure, unassuming photographer lived alone in Brooklyn, operating his business from a storefront. Rudolf Abel attracted little attention until it was revealed he headed a Soviet spy ring operating in America. He was caught and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Do you feel that you received a fair trial? I would refer that question to my attorney, Mr. Donovan. Our American system of trial by jury is the fairest system in the world. In the world of espionage, Abel was known as an illegal, a spy who lives under an assumed name and is controlled by Department S of the KGB. It is Department S that selects the agents who quietly blend into the societies of other nations and lead seemingly normal lives while secretly carrying out orders passed to them from Moscow. This is part of a television program about the black riots in America in 1968. It was produced by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The end credits are interesting in that the sound man on the film crew, Rudy Herman, was a KGB illegal. 
He was Colonel Rudolf Hermann, whose cover story bears many similarities to that of Colonel Abel. Both men entered the U.S. through Canada and both pursued careers in the film industry. Rudolf Hermann went first to Toronto, where he lived quietly with his family in a small house on Sutherland Avenue. He was ordered to take a job with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In 1969, Colonel Herman was ordered by Moscow to move from Toronto to New York and set up as a photographer while he organized his network of espionage in the United States. His appearance has been disguised and his voice electronically altered. Oh yes, for the past 25 years I was getting every weekend on two days a radio transmission. When Herman was finally caught by the FBI, Richard Kinsey was deputy chief of the Soviet desk at FBI headquarters in Washington. He had been sent on meetings, had he, or had been sent to yes. meet people in Canada for one thing. Had he not? Yes, he had. Do you know anything about why he was sent up to Canada? I'd prefer not to go into uh, to that. Colonel Herman traveled to Quebec City where he went to Laval University and met with a Canadian economics professor named Hugh Hambleton. Hello, are you Professor Hambleton? Uh, yes, I am, yeah. Hugh Hambleton is a specialist in petroleum economics. He has been named by Colonel Herman as a long-time trusted source. Professor Hambleton met Herman many times and supplied him with information. This interview was filmed with hidden cameras. How did you meet Rudy Herman? I came with Laval, that's exactly right. I mean, I am pretty honest. Like, when did he come to Laval? I don't know the guy, uh, you know, it's just, you know, your face is the guy. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm being honest. Like, yeah. I don't remember exactly. I just know I knew him at Laval. I certainly didn't know him anywhere else. Well, I mean, Herman met a, Hamilton at least a dozen times in Canada, and in 1975, they met in Haiti, where Hamilton passed Herman information about the Chinese embassy to come there to see you. There was a top secret FBI RCMP operation targeting Professor Hambleton and Colonel Herman, codenamed Red Pepper. What was the reason for the meetings between Herman and Hambleton? Again, you're getting into what is still a sensitive area. Uh, I can say this, that uh, Colonel Herman was ordered to contact uh, Hambleton by his own admission, by his superiors in Moscow. But beyond that, I would not like to go. Professor Hambleton is not as naive as he might appear. During World War II, he worked for Free French Intelligence. After the war, he worked for Canadian Intelligence in Germany. But then, in the late 1940s, he met in Ottawa with Vladimir Borodin, a senior recruiter for Soviet intelligence. You met Borodin in 48, did you not? From 1956 to 1961, Hambleton had top secret security clearance when he worked for NATO in Paris. Professor Hambleton has also made two trips to Cuba. He met with a leading Cuban intelligence officer, Ricardo Escartin, who has recently been expelled from the United States for espionage activities. In 1975, he made a trip to Moscow. How come you went to the Soviet Union? I didn't go. But you didn't go to the Soviet Union at all? What information? Later, he confessed to making a 10 to 12 day trip to the Soviet Union in 1975, where, in his own words, he was under considerable pressure from the KGB. Subsequently, the RCMP raided Hambleton's Ottawa residence and seized a shortwave radio and code books. Professor Hambleton was just one of Colonel Herman's contacts. Herman has provided the FBI with significant leads on Soviet agents operating in North America. His espionage activities were of the utmost importance. My job was, would be without any importance. I would definitely not spend such a long time in the United States. And besides, uh, you know, during my years of service, I was several times promoted. 
Now Colonel Herman is somewhere in hiding in the United States, an illegal who came to the surface. Carlo Tuomi is another example of an illegal sent to America by Moscow. You were known as an illegal. What exactly is an illegal? Illegal is a foreign agent who enters the country with forged documents and establishes himself as a, as a citizen of that country. Um, little by little acquires all the documentation, the driver's license, uh, and birth certificates, credit cards, and so, and so on. Finds a job, uh, gets all the credentials and all the background, uh, future references as a bona fide citizen of that country. For instance, in this case... That's what happened to you, right? That's right. And you got all this from Moscow when you were trained as a spy at a spy school in Moscow? That's right. That's right. That was a major part of my schooling. In case of North America, Canada, and the United States, what is much more dangerous are these so-called illegals who are smuggled into these countries. That is, people who, are, who come here under a new identity, and they, they live as citizens of these countries, and they would start operating really in, in case of war between the Soviet Union and the United States, for example, or in, in, in the time of major, of a very serious crisis when, for example, the diplomatic relations would be broken. In case of war, I would, I would be among other illegals, the only means by which the Soviet Union could get any military intelligence from the, uh, from the United States because all their diplomatic means, all their open means would be cut off. And at the time you were with Czech intelligence, yeah. there were actually agents sent over here yes, that's right. who were to just sit and wait. That's right, yeah. Uh, very many. The Soviets used many routes to secretly place their illegals. The Soviet fishing fleets, which regularly stop at North American ports, have often provided the KGB with a secure means of landing their spies. Boris Stern was a photojournalist with the Soviet fishing fleet and recalls an incident he once witnessed. One time, we left a man in St. John's, Newfoundland, he had been kept in hiding on my boat. I thought, the other people on our boat thought, he was an illegal being dropped into Canada. You believe that this was a case of dropping a spy off in Canada? Yes. Within the KGB, there is another department which controls illegals. Department V conducts what are known within the KGB by the macabre description, wet affairs assassinations, sabotage, and other violent acts. It is the department that takes care of the dirty work of the KGB. People Until he defected to the West, Arkady Shevchenko was the senior Soviet at the UN. That has been uh, uh, the department uh, with, uh, which uh, operates in the, in the secret, see, which is even unbelievable for the Soviet secret society. Have All you ever known operations are... Have you ever so, known of any Department V people in North America? Yes, it was in New York, in the Soviet mission in New York, in the, in the middle of the 60s. And uh, uh, the, one of my friends who happened also to be working with the KGB, uh, he they told me, look, you know, he lo he, this man looks so quiet, calm, and even respectable as someone. If, if you look at him, you would never believe that he really, what he is really doing. And... To what branch or to what department of the KGB he himself belonged. That is the most sinister thing in the world which he is doing. This man was a member of Department V. He was trained in Moscow and sent to Canada, where explosives had already been hidden for his use. Well, then fine, let's do an interview. I mean, okay, well. He refused to be interviewed. After months of work, the Norfolk Investigative Unit traced him to a small town where he now lives in hiding. 
in the KGB and you were sent over here to North America to engage in espionage acts and you decided for one reason or another not to go through with this. And, uh, however, Zabotka was sent to Edmonton in Western Canada where he spent four years working and acquiring all the credentials of a normal Canadian citizen. In 1965, the call came from Moscow. He was ordered to go to a Toronto suburb and observe a house and its occupants. The house was at the time inhabited by one of the most famous defectors of all, Igor Guzenko, who fled the Soviet embassy in 1945. His defection led to the uncovering of Soviet spy rings in North America and was a severe setback for Soviet espionage. Twenty years after it occurred, Department V of the KGB was still sending its agents looking for him. It's become so close. In my life, of course, was very, very... And if I open door, this is it, I never open door. Never open door in my house. Possibly you went to the wrong house? <laughs> I don't know, really don't know. So he could be my come in the wrong house or something, but I never myself opened door. Sabotka had been activated by KGB agent Oleg Komenko, who at the time was working as a counselor at the Soviet embassy in Ottawa and was traveling with the Russian Moiseev Ballet on a North American tour. Strategically placed in Western Canada, Sabotka was ordered to plan, in the event of war, the destruction of the key refining and pumping stations that supply much of North America with its energy. Edmonton is also a center of top-secret cold-weather testing for Canadian and American forces, and Sabotka was ordered to find all he could about these facilities. He had other important missions, one of which was to act as a link between Moscow and a KGB sabotage network in North America. I would presume it was no accident that you were sent out to Edmonton with oil refineries and all that sort of thing. It, it was not an accident you were sent there? No, and I would presume that they, they had their plans on that I must really go. This house off Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C. is an office of the Soviet military attaches. Some of these men have legitimate business there. However, most military attaches in reality are spies of the GRU, operating closely with the KGB. Working under the Ministry of Defense, the GRU specifically confines its activities to espionage in military matters. The first chief directorate of the KGB, however, has ultimate authority over the GRU espionage networks. During World War II, Carlo Tuomi was recruited into the Soviet military intelligence. He was born in Michigan of Finnish parents who left America and went to the Soviet Union while he was still a boy. His boyhood knowledge of America made him a natural candidate to become a Soviet spy sent back to the U.S. as an illegal. I was trained to collect military information about the United States armed forces with special emphasis on, on naval affairs and shipment of arms, uh, locations of uh, uh, docks and warehouses, specifically in the harbor of New York where these arms were being stored and handled and from where they being shipped to foreign countries. In other words, you were a spy. That's true. I studied the, the United States in general, the geography, economy, government, armed forces. The woman who was uh, my English instructor I've been born in Brooklyn, was a graduate of Columbia University, had an excellent command of uh, modern American English. What about uh, the American culture? I mean, how were you trained so that you would feel at home in America once you got there from Moscow? Well, uh, 
that basic way of getting me into touch with American reality and culture was by showing American movies. From movies, you can learn quite a bit how people behave, how they dress, how they talk. And so that's a very important way to train an agent who is to operate in that particular country. One of my, uh, one of the agents, he was not an instructor, but he was a more administrative uh, personnel. He took me to a storehouse which looked like a, really like an American clothing store where they picked the clothing the right size. Uh, well, the suits and overcoat had to be, uh, had to be adjusted. Were these American clothes that were shipped yeah, over to the Soviet Union? Yeah, they were American clothes. Uh, a lot of them were from Macy's. I entered the United States by train. I took a train from Montreal to Chicago. So Canada was used as a, as a stepping ground to enter the United States. Is Canada a usual way that the Soviets put spies in the United States? It is, uh, it is considered the easiest way. Soviet agents in the U.S. went to great lengths to create what is called his legend or his cover story. This legend, uh, for the later years where I was employed, especially in New York, in New York and in, um, in Milwaukee, the Soviet diplomatic intelligence agents had done a lot of groundwork. They had studied these different places. Uh, they, they took pictures from the outside. They had even some pictures taken inside of these, these places. In Moscow, Tuomi was shown these photographs of a lumber company in the Bronx where he was supposed to have worked and of a General Electric plant where he was also supposed to have been employed. They have been taken by uh, Soviet diplomatic personnel, in most cases working for the UN. Instructions for me originated in Moscow and were sent in coded form to Soviet intelligence agents who were posing as uh, UN diplomats. And they were uh, processed by these uh, uh, diplomat spies and then sent to me um, uh, by letter with a New York postmark. Did you ever get money from Soviet officials working with or for the UN? Definitely. They, they left the drops, uh, uh, magnetic containers like this. I usually, I usually received uh, $3,000 at a time. It was always in advance. Once I received $5,400, which, which was in advance, this container how was the container used? Well, the top of the container is magnetized and then it is left at a predetermined place, which is called a drop, under a railroad bridge, under an elevated, uh, um, inside a, a support of a bridge or something, and it was never lost. This was a very reliable gadget. And this was used all over New York City? Or yes. in places in New York City? Yes, I had four different drops. As this FBI photo shows, Tuomi met with his Soviet handler, Alexei Galkin. He then took a cover job at Tiffany's Jewelers in New York. Beneath this subway bridge in the Bronx was one of the drop points he had for messages. Another was the Hudson River train line. Another was under this railroad bridge in Queens at 69th Street. Another on this telephone pole in Yonkers. Once he was well established, Tuomi was ordered to take a job where he could carry out surveillance of the docks at the port of New York. Eventually, he was caught by the FBI and became a double agent. When you were caught by the FBI, did you try to signal your Soviet handlers at the UN or in Moscow that you had been caught? Not immediately, because I, 
I couldn't. It was in my mind, but I, I couldn't do it immediately. I did send the, a signal to the center, which is Soviet intelligence, uh, military intelligence headquarters in Moscow. I sent a signal uh, three months after I had been caught by the FBI. How did you send the signal? What means? I, I sent the signal by inserting it in a, a message which I wrote under, under the control of the FBI. But I got away from the FBI agents for a few minutes uh, to write that message using the, uh, using the washroom. And was this a hidden writing technique that you used? Yes, I, uh, I had uh, an extra sheet of uh, uh, chemically treated paper, which was used for secret writing, and I used that in, in the washroom. There was an internal struggle inside of me. I was torn apart. I was pro-Soviet. I believed in a Soviet system, and here I was working for the FBI, the enemy of my country. I, I just couldn't live with the idea of, uh, of uh, betraying the Soviet Union. Are you still pro-Soviet? Oh, definitely not. So what changed you? I don't understand how you've changed or why you've changed. That's a, that's a very long process, uh, something that doesn't happen overnight. This is the KGB Blue Book, where Tuomi is listed under his Soviet name. In it, he is named as an enemy of the fatherland. But even a spy caught and turned finds it difficult to be parted from his country. Because of the family. Your I, family that you had over in the Soviet Union. Yes, I, uh, I had a wife and I had three children. Otherwise, uh, coming to, back to the United States, that, that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Have you ever heard from your former wife or your children? No, I haven't heard from them since 1963. On November 15, 1979, Sir Anthony Blunt, a distinguished British art historian and the art advisor to the Queen, was stripped of his knighthood. A shocked House of Commons had been told by the Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher, that Blunt had been a Soviet agent. While at Cambridge University in the 30s, he acted as a talent spotter for the Soviets, and later, while a member of British intelligence, he continued to pass information to the Russians. By remaining silent about his friends involved in spying, he was directly responsible for exposing British agents and operations. In the mid-1930s, it seemed to me and to many of my contemporaries that the Communist Party and Russia constituted the only firm bulwark against fascism, since the Western democracies were taking an uncertain and compromising attitude towards Germany. I was persuaded by Guy Burgess that I could best serve the cause of anti-fascism by joining him in his work for the Russians. This was a case of political conscience against loyalty to country. I chose conscience. When later I realized the true facts about Russia, I was prevented from taking any action by personal loyalty. I could not denounce my friends. Cambridge University in the 1930s, where young men were recruited to rise up quietly to the highest ranks of the British establishment while secretly working for the Soviets. These were the moles. The most notorious was Kim Philby, who rose to be a senior officer in MI6, the British intelligence agency. As liaison officer with the CIA, Philby was well-placed to relay vital Western secrets to the Soviets. Since 1963, Philby has lived in Moscow and is a colonel in the KGB. His tip-offs were to cost many Western agents their lives. Donald McLean and Guy Burgess were working for the Foreign Office and both were friends of Philby. They also worked for the Soviets until they fled to Moscow in 1952. 
As head of the American department, McLean had access to these top secret briefs of President Truman's assurances to then British Prime Minister Attlee that American threats to use the atomic bomb in the Korean War would never be carried out. This valuable information went straight to McLean's Soviet handlers. But there were many Americans also involved in similar activities. In the 1930s, Nathaniel Weil was one of thousands of young Americans who decided that the fascism of Hitler's Germany was the true enemy and that communism was the answer. He became a secret party member who took his orders from the Soviets while working for the U.S. government. We were to rise into positions of as much power as we could in the government to influence the government in a socialist or communist direction. And... Um, so that in the event of our victory, it would be trained men to take over uh, major governmental tasks. Seen here at a government conference in the 30s, Nathaniel Weil was just one of many Americans secretly working for the Soviets within the U.S. government. We were to sever all connections with known communists abruptly and instantly. We were not to... Uh, express left-wing views under any circumstances. And if we saw people who seemed to us likely recruits, we would bring the name before the group where this would be discussed. But we would have no further contact with that person. In other words, a decision would be made, and then some entirely different person would make this, the approach, thus preserving the uh, clandestine nature of the cell. Harry Dexter White, Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury during the war years, was entrusted with the responsibility for all Treasury policy bearing on foreign relations. He was also a Soviet mole. In his sensitive position, he was not only well-placed to pass on intelligence material, but to influence policy decisions as well. Under Soviet instructions, White drafted a plan for Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's closest advisors, which was presented to the Allies gathered at the Quebec Conference in September 1944. Dismissed as ill-conceived by Winston Churchill and the Chiefs of Staff, the Morgenthau Plan called for the total deindustrialization of Germany after the war under the pretext of permanently disabling German militarism. It received wide publicity, particularly in Germany, where Adolf Hitler faced opposition from his own officer corps and had recently survived an unsuccessful bomb plot on his life from amongst their numbers. In the face of advancing Allied armies, German propagandists called for determined opposition as the only alternative to the grim future offered by the Morgenthau Plan. Germany was to be shattered no matter what. An early end to the war would have interfered with the Soviets' plans. In late 1944, their forces were still far to the east. But by May 1945, when Germany finally surrendered, all of Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, East Germany, and Romania were in their sphere of influence. Harry Dexter White's influence on behalf of the Soviets was not restricted to the European theater of battle. In China, the Soviets were supporting Mao Zedong in his battle against both the Japanese and the nationalist Chinese forces of Chiang Kai-shek. In 1943, President Roosevelt agreed to lend Chiang's armies $500 million for their fight against the Japanese and agreed to immediately deliver $200 million in gold. But White's personal control over the Chinese currency stabilization program enabled him to ignore the declared policy of Roosevelt and Congress and delay the gold shipments. The Chinese economy continued to collapse, paving the way for the eventual takeover by the communists. There were others. Lachlan Curry was President Roosevelt's personal emissary to the nationalist Chinese. Yet he, too, was secretly working with the Soviets to destabilize nationalist China. 
But it was not until a few years later that a shocked nation learned the extent of Soviet penetration when Elizabeth Bentley, a Soviet spy and courier, testified before a U.S. Senate committee. We were getting information from the Army, particularly the Air Corps, from the Treasury, from the State Department, from the OSS, from the CIAA, the Rockefeller Committee, from the OWI. Treasury? Oh, yeah. I did not, didn't I name the Treasury? Yes. The War Production Board? Yes, from the War Production Board, from the War Manpower Commission. I think that about covers it, Senator. Yeah, all right. Now will you describe the kind of information that you were getting out of these departments? She revealed that she had passed to the Soviets inside White House information that Lachlan Curry had given to her. He did pass on the information that the American government was just about to break the Soviet code. What happened then? I relayed that to the Russians. They wanted to know which code, which I couldn't obviously tell them. But Elizabeth Bentley named Harry Dexter White as the man who did the most damage. In his appearance before a U.S. congressional committee, he denied he had ever been a communist. Two days later, he died of a heart attack. All these people were accused by um, former Soviet spy masters of being espionage agents of the Soviet government. As a so man, we must assume that today the situation is worse since all of our security has broken down. was the operation to acquire the information needed to build the atomic bomb. In 1953, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were executed for relaying atomic information to the Soviets. But by far the most important secrets were obtained from highly placed agents working directly on the top secret Manhattan Project. British diplomat Donald McLean photographed classified documents at Atomic Energy headquarters for the Russians. Klaus Fuchs, a German scientist, infiltrated the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. These two were the key operatives passing the latest developments to the Soviets. Fuchs served less than 10 years in a British jail and left for a hero's welcome and a top scientific post in East Germany. Scientific espionage is a critical area of operations for the KGB. Department T uses business fronts, trade delegations, and exchange programs as covers to acquire America's scientific and industrial knowledge. Many American campuses are host to large numbers of Soviet scientists. The universities are often the site of secret scientific research in areas of industrial and military significance. For 10 years, Professor Robert Burns of Indiana University ran the academic exchange program between the Soviet Union and the United States. Well, for what purposes have Soviets been in this country? Well, very clearly to get access to Amer American science and technology. Very often to get access to particular fields in which they are especially weak. One of my colleagues in the 60s made a study of Kosygin, a Kosygin speech identifying their shortcomings and the list of Soviet scholars who came to the, next, the United States in the next few years. The list dovetailed perfectly. This year, the Soviets tried to send 19 people in very highly classified fields in order to get around the restrictions that we placed on exporting equipment after the invasion of Afghanistan. An examination of the list of U.S. scholars in the Soviet Union is revealing. It shows, without exception, that the topics studied are all in the humanities, history, literature, and the arts. Soviets do not allow us to study the 20th century. In all of the 20 years of the, 22 years of the exchange program, we have not sent anyone to the Soviet Union to study the things in which many Americans are most interested. But the Soviets studying in the U.S. are enrolled in virtually every strategically important area of research being carried out. Lasers, microcircuitry, and ceramics all subjects that have applications to spacecraft, missiles, and weapons aimed at the United States. 
But while the Soviet scholars are welcomed with academic courtesy in North America, the same is not true of Western scholars in the Soviet Union. I made a study of the exchanges from 1958 through 1975, and something like 20% of the American participants in the major program were affected by the KGB in one way or another, obviously followed, in some cases harassed and intimidated, in a few cases seduced and put under pressures to provide information about fellow students or about American embassy officials. One victim of the KGB's manipulation of exchange programs was Canadian professor Johann Königstein, targeted because of his expertise with laser technology. Department T of the KGB often works closely with the GRU, Soviet military intelligence, whose objective is to acquire military technology. While visiting the Soviet Union, Professor Königstein was involved with a female operative of the KGB, Galina Nusinova. Returning to Ottawa, he met with Yuri Usati of the GRU, who convinced him to take a laser along on his next visit without filing the proper export authorization forms. Because, in my opinion, it was uh, like taking a book with me or something like that. Yeah, because if you took it well, over, it was because course, why did you take it over? Well, to do these experiments, they had to be done. I didn't want to do all that routine kind of research. Not all technology is gained by academic exchanges. Many North American companies are approached on a commercial basis by the KGB. Heiko, a Vancouver firm, built the Pisces, the most advanced deep-sea submersible in the world. As the Soviets lagged far behind the West in deep-sea technology, they were anxious to obtain the submersible, so Heiko was approached by a KGB agent named Segalovich working for Department T. But Heiko was forbidden to export its product to the Soviet Union because the Pisces utilized secret welding techniques used on U.S. atomic submarines. In order to avoid the export ban, the submersible was sent part by part to Switzerland, where it was assembled and tested off the coast of Italy. It was then sent to the Soviet Union, giving them instant parity with the West. Department T of the KGB often devises intricate schemes using third-party nationals to act as middlemen to illegally avoid export bans placed on strategic technology. Peter Virag, a Montreal lawyer, recently entered into an export deal involving sophisticated computer equipment. Aware the equipment would require special export licenses if destined for other countries, Virag arranged for the equipment to be initially exported to Canada. He then illegally re-exported the computer equipment to European centers, where his partner sent it on to final destinations behind the Iron Curtain. This man, Marc André de Geiter, is a Belgian with business ties in the Soviet Union. Through bribery, he tried to obtain a computer source code valuable to the Soviet military because it simplifies computer operations, thus reducing the size of the computer required. But the transfer of American technology to the Soviets is not only accomplished by the subterfuges of the KGB. Much of it is done openly. For as Lenin had predicted, when the time comes to hang the capitalists, they will be eager to sell us the rope. A Texas company has sold the Soviets devices known as array processors, which are now being used on Soviet killer submarines. The array processors interpret underwater signals and target the locations of other submarines. In Corona, California, the principals of Spar Optical Research Incorporated were convicted of exporting copper water-cooled mirrors to Europe for reshipment to the Soviet Union. These mirrors are essential to particle beam and laser research, and the Soviet military is now closer to achieving the ability to destroy vital communication satellites. A New England firm in 1972 sold the Soviets their product, one of the most advanced ball-bearing manufacturing machines in the world. The miniature ball bearings are essential to the successful launch of multiple warheads from a single missile. Americans have also provided the Soviets with the technology critical to the guidance systems that greatly increase the accuracy of Soviet missiles. Dr. Miles Kostik is a Washington-based defense analyst. The 
acquisition of American inertial guidance technology, which consists of three different technologies, has enabled Soviets to abridge a tremendous gap in the circular error probable, namely precision of on-target delivery of their missiles. When they started, they were about three miles of the target, and this was not so long ago, about eight years ago. But now the Soviet missiles are accurate to within 600 feet of American missile silos. In order to overcome this increased Soviet accuracy, the MX missile system has been proposed. It is the largest construction program in the history of mankind, with missiles on movable carriers. And that new missile, which is the MX missile system, will cost us 60 to 100 billion dollars strictly to offset the advantages which Soviet acquired through their scientific and industrial espionage in the United States. Yuri Bizminov is a former KGB agent. Follows the statement of a very ancient Chinese philosopher. These men are members of the KGB, working in North America. This man is an illegal, a spy trained in Moscow and sent to the United States. This man is a defector from Cuban intelligence, living in hiding under constant threat of death. This man ran operations against the West from Czechoslovakia. This man was trained by the most sinister department of the KGB and sent to North America. All of them received their orders from here. Number two, Dzerzhinsky Square in Moscow. This is the headquarters of the KGB. From here, the KGB continues to carry out the mandate given to the secret police by Lenin, who said it was to be the sword and shield of the revolution, the offense and defense of Soviet aims throughout the world. Lubyanka prison is the center of the vast KGB bureaucracy directly responsible to the Politburo for its operations against the West. Ever since Lenin took over the secret police of his defeated enemy, the Tsar, the Soviet espionage apparatus has mirrored the leadership under which it serves. Under Lenin, in the early days of revolutionary turmoil, it was known as the Cheka, and it imposed the Bolshevik rule upon the nation, setting up an international network of informers and tracking down and liquidating enemies of the new regime. Under Stalin, the name of the secret police was changed to GPU, and it became the most effective instrument of mass murder until the Second World War. Stalin used the GPU to eradicate millions of peasants in the Ukraine who protested the creation of collective farms from their lands. And during the mid-30s, Russia was wracked by what became known as the terror, the mass purges created by Stalin. Show trials became a function of the secret police activities and more than 75% of the Soviet general staff of the army and senior ministries were arrested by the GPU, tried and executed. In 1953, Stalin died. It was appropriate that the small band of survivors at the top of the communist hierarchy quickly arrested one of their own, Lavrenti Beria, the ambitious and coldly ruthless head of the secret police, which by then had become known as the NKVD. It was Beria who had presided over the purges ordered by Stalin. 
he himself was executed. In 1955, Nikita Khrushchev took full power. The secret police became known as the KGB. Under Khrushchev and his successors, the KGB looked increasingly outward to espionage and intelligence activities in the rest of the world. In the past decade, it has become a vanguard element of Soviet expansion and activities throughout the Third World, Western Europe, and North America. The KGB has become a massive bureaucracy reporting directly to the Politburo, the select body that runs the Soviet Union. Its functions are tied to the International Department, which runs and finances both communist and non-communist organizations in other countries, and to the Ministry of Defense, with whom it shares espionage activities in other nations. The KGB is organized into chief directorates. From a separate headquarters in Moscow, the first chief directorate controls foreign espionage activities. The second chief directorate is the largest and most important. With a network of informers, it is responsible for ensuring internal security. The current head of the KGB is Yuri Andropov, a key member of the Politburo, a close colleague of Leonid Brezhnev, and one of the most powerful men in Russia. As head of the KGB, Andropov controls the most influential and sinister bureau of the Soviet bureaucracy, whose main purpose is the total control of the Soviet people. For North America, the activities of the first chief directorate are divided into departments which carry out a wide range of activities from Soviet establishments located across the continent. Since 1933, this building has served as a Soviet embassy in Washington. It is a major center of espionage activity in the United States. This is Alexander Kluyev, listed as an attaché at the embassy. He is a KGB officer. This is Boris Ivanov, a correspondent with the Soviet news service, TASS. He is also a KGB officer. During a recent hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the principal witness was Harold Brown, who at that time was secretary. Uh, label many American diplomats, politicians, cultural representatives abroad as CIA agents and paralyze their positions. Uh, specifically in 1966, that the first major operation was to prepare a book which was is called Who is Who in CIA. The book Who's Who in CIA was the beginning of the exposés that seriously undermined American intelligence capabilities for almost a decade. So powerful was the impact of this book that its imitators, like Philip Agee's Covert Action Information Bulletin, frequently refer to it as source material, as do other major news sources. It was used as a source in this ABC nightly news television broadcast in November 1980, claiming that the Reverend Jim Jones had a secret CIA associate before the Guyana massacre. This man, Richard Dwyer, is the focal point of many of the questions surrounding the possible CIA involvement at Jonestown. He's a career diplomat who served in sensitive posts throughout the Mideast. Two years ago, he was the deputy mission chief in Guyana. He is listed as a CIA agent in a publication that for years has specialized in such allegations. The CIA denies the accusation. But it was Ladislav Bittman who was one of the real authors of Who's Who in CIA. And although it was not published under his name, the book received exactly the attention he hoped it would. Shortly after coming to the United States, I found this book in many bookstores. I have it at home. <laughs> uh, and it... it, it for example, it was quoted by the uh, covert action bulletin, or is, is this the, AG's group, the group? Yes, right? that's right. Philip it's one of, one of the major sources of information about CIA man. <laughs> that's, of course, that's ironic because that is a communist disinformation. Konstantin Hanf is a New York-based journalist for Polish language newspapers in North America. 
when he decided to expose communist agents in the U.S., the long reach of the KGB influenced his life. 76, we started a wave of exposure of Soviet and Polish communist uh, intelligence network, especially here in New York. We exposed uh, agents mostly working around the United Nations. What agents were these? Who were they working for? For the KGB. Any other? A Polish communist intelligence service, which is actually nothing but uh, an arm of KGB too. Shortly after his exposés of the KGB in New York, Hanf's stories were published in a heavily ethnic area in Winnipeg, several thousand miles to the west, by the weekly newspaper CHAS, the Polish Times. In July 1978, on a day the paper had not planned to publish, a bizarre edition of the weekly was put into circulation with articles and semi-nude photos designed to offend its conservative and older readership. It was done in a very clever way, you know, because uh, the look of it was exactly the same as we would have printed, you know, but uh, some things struck us right away. For example, right on the front pages that uh, uh, beautifully breasted women, you know, which we wouldn't have never put into a paper simply for the same, for different reasons, you know, but our readers are mostly middle-aged people who would never dream of doing kind of thing like that, you know. Inside the paper we have a picture of one of our correspondents in the uniform of a German Wehrmacht, you know, and the letter supposedly written by a Jewish writer referring to our, our, our journalist, our, our contributor to the paper, Mr. Hunt, as a war criminal, not a war criminal. The funny part of it is that uh, when the war ended, he was about 18 years old, you know, and yet they said that he was high-ranking officer, you know, that he has killed so many Jews and this and that, you know, and there's another article portraying uh, Mr. Hanf as an agent of, uh, you take it, KGB, CIA, FBI, everything under the sun. It has become a classic case of Soviet bloc disinformation on a very personal level. The charges against Hanf were also made in a letter supposedly written by the Jewish Defense League of New York, and the letter was sent out to advertisers of the newspaper, informing them that Chas was harboring a Nazi war criminal. I am Polish from my belief and from my birth and uh, from my uh, persuasion, I would say, but my father was a German, so my... Uh, engagement in the in the American in the German army was not incidental actually because how long were you in the German army and just what did you do I was uh, a regular soldier I was drafted in uh, March of 44 March 1944 yes when I was 17 and a half of age and in February of seven of 45 I was uh, captured by the Soviets the accusing letter was revealed to be a forgery when the real Jewish Defense League examined this and declared it had not been written on their stationery and also that they had never accused Mr. Hanf of any war crimes. What effect would this have had on your readership? What effect did this have on your advertisers? I mean, what was, what was it? Well, like? obviously, uh, I think the main aim was to stop Charles being published and have the same editorial policy as it was, you know, since Mr. Mroczkowski took over. And they wanted, I'm sure, to create panic on the board of directors so that you would fire him and get some woolly-headed uh, fellow, you know, which would be a little bit softer on communism. Yeah, there is a <clears throat> long-term plan and strategy how to, uh, how to frighten prominent exiles who are politically active or organizations that are very uh, uh, anti-Soviet or anti-communist. Uh, so, and I have to admit that this is a, rel a relatively an easy uh, thing to do. Why? Because m most exiles, most refugees or immig immigrants have some kind of relations with the mother country, with the people, with the relatives there, and they uh, they can be even blackmailed because 
Imagine that you have a mother there, and somebody comes and says, so if you don't cooperate, or if you, if you continue speaking against us, your mother will have a very tough life, my dear friends. 